Hello, my name is Peter Bonnell, a Senior Curator of Quad. Welcome to uh, the latest Quad virtual exhibition tours. And today I'm super pleased to welcome all the way from Los Angeles, our artist Rebecca Allen, and all the way from London, uh, Helen Starr, curator uh, of the exhibition with me and the founder and director of the Mechatronic Library. Hi, Rebecca. Hello. Hi, Helen. Hi, hello. So today we are going to do a tour of Rebecca's show from uh, 10th of November 2018, 3rd of February 2019, Sync Emerge Consciousness. Uh, a huge pleasure to work with a, an artist of the stature of Rebecca Allen. I heard a Radio 4 programme that noted her as a digital art pioneer, uh, and that very much is the case, to say the least. So without further ado, I will be the guide through the space, and I'm going to allow Helen and Rebecca to talk a great length about two works in particular as we, we go through the exhibition space here in Quad Gallery One. Well, first of all, we're going to just look a little bit at some of Rebecca's uh, early work that were at the entrance of the exhibition. And on the left over here is the, the 1982 uh, video work Steps. And I'll just, just bring up the screen here. So if you are looking at this 3D scan at home, you should be able to bring up the, the video files and even play them full screen. So Rebecca, would you like to say a few words about um, Steps? Oh yes, thank you. This was one of my earliest pieces, earlier pieces using digital technology. And it drew from my inspiration as an artist, which was looking at art movements of the industrial age, like the <clears throat> Bauhaus, the constructivists and futurists. And it really was what got me as an artist thinking, what can I do today? Uh, what is the new age we're entering? And I thought computers are gonna be important. And from that point on, this was in the early 1970s, I decided as an artist that I would dedicate myself to working with new digital technologies to create new art forms. So with this piece, another interest as an artist I had was in, in motion, in the art of motion and in human motion, how humans through our movement convey our behaviors and personalities um, and our relationships. And this piece was a dance piece. Um, it, drew from Bauhaus theater taking simple geometric forms, but once they start moving, they come to life. It was a collaboration I did with MIT and uh, Joffrey Ballet in the US when I was at a place called the Computer Graphics Laboratory in New York. At that time, it was the premier place to invent these new technologies, how to model, how to render, how to animate. So this was an art piece. Um, I, I wanted to, being in it, it, uh, both an artist and researcher, I wanted to create artworks ultimately, not just do research and research papers. Mm -hmm. um, should we play just a few, as I start, sorry, I, I, the, the sound yeah, comes please. out into mix, but I think people at home can hear. And I wish I uh, could watch those films all day, and, and indeed I did in the gallery space. And I note the figure, the use of the figure, the interest in the figure, dance and performance was was so key to your work. And should we go to this work, Steady State from 1989? Um, and I'll just bring up the dialogue box, and you can see, it, again, the, the very figurative form begins to really appear in the work uh, at this stage and earlier. Yes, in this piece, I was uh, this was a, later in 1989. And even though I worked extensively with the human form in, in art in a computer generated form and trying to get that form to come to life and move. In this piece, uh, because it was a very hard technical problem, um, but I wanted to mix and actual live performers, um, I created these costumes that really made them almost look like digital forms and worked with the choreographer to 
make a piece that was inspired by my time in Spain. I spent, I had a number of commissions in mostly in Barcelona. This was for a, a, a TV series called the Art, El Art del Video, the Art of Video. Um, and they had commissioned me to make a piece and to produce it in Spain. So I, I again was thinking about our movements, human body, male female relationships and putting it in this inspirational uh, environment that was inspired by Gaudi and some of the incredible architecture that you see in Barcelona. Should we play just a little uh, introduction yeah. excerpt to this, this, this film too? Here we go. Yeah, I was also playing with the negative space of movement too. Um, as you see this, this piece, sometimes the body movements are represented just in the negative form, the space between their arms and legs and showing the abstraction of movement with the negative body space from the body movements. And talking of, of body and, and shape and form, and we come over to this large screen wall over here that had two films on, Labyrinth from 92. And you have a, a, a fantastic and awe-inspiring track record of being approached by great artists, great musicians of the 20th century, including John Paul Jones. Uh, in, and you work with him in the film work Labyrinth from 92. But right. it's particularly pertinent today um, to talk about this work, Music Nonstop by the seminal... German techno pop group Kraftwerk and the sad passing of Florian Schneider. We'd like to pay um, homage to Florian and if you could talk a little bit about your time with, with Kraftwerk and how this work came about. Yeah, such terribly sad news just hearing about it yesterday, the passing of Florian. And he was, it's particularly sad for me because he was my closest friend of, of craft work. He was uh, the one I first met in, we met in Paris with him and Ralph. They were bicycling there and we drove on the Autobahn to Dusseldorf to uh, do some work at Kling Klang Studio. Um, for me as an artist working trying to invent a new art form with digital technology, it couldn't have been more exciting to work with these incredible pioneers of digital music where they invented a new sound using computers. Mm -hmm. So to, to meet them and have this opportunity to collaborate where um, I had told them, I, I'm, this is a video, I know you have these robotic forms that go on stage with you sometime, but I'm going to make you all virtual and we're going to have uh, virtual representations of you. And thinking of Kraft, uh, of Florian in particular, he was, he was so funny first. I mean, it, it's hard to believe when their, their public image is so serene and somber and, and uh, non-smiling. <laughs> I think they're playing with the press that called them emotionless robots, but <laughs> he was so funny and so fun to be with. And also he loved old things. I, I have an old German telephone he gave me from a flea market. He was very fascinated in kitschy older things and uh which is funny because he is the inventor of the future of music so really sad to hear him pass about his passing um and i i'll just mention in this piece which started in 1984 um it it came out in 1986 just because they they just <laughs> weren't ready to read release the music until 1986. But um, in 1984, when we started, I took their mannequin heads, these heads they had made, and put them into the computer. A, at that time, very hard problem technically to get a human face to move and express. So as an artist slash digital researcher, I could 
justify doing this artistic work by also working on the research of getting facial animation and body movement and creating what was a perfect venue for an artist making short experimental works, things like MTV and the music video channels. Shall we play a few opening bars of this amazing song and, and look at this oh, yes, amazing thanks. animation, exactly what you're talking about in terms of how you brought their faces to life? I could, uh, as, as I did, I could watch that video time <laughs> and time again and again. So without further ado, I'd like to bring us into the main space here. This space included two VR works inside to my right over there, the Tangle of Mind and Matter. And in this curved space with the shadows that pop up is the new commission you made for Quad, uh, Life Without Matter. But what I'd like to do is uh, go into this screen room here and bring Helen start into the conversation now who has a number of amazing questions for you that we will go through unfortunately far too quickly but Helen would you like to start and talk a little about Bush Seller? Um, yes hello so um, Rebecca for me two of your works Bush Soul and Life Without Matter made 20 years apart really grapple with the idea of the authentic self and what it really means to be in the world when we can only ever know our own selves. So sort of what is it to be oneself at one with oneself or truly representing oneself? Bush Soul is a heady mix of Orisha, Deoism and your futuristic telling of gaming culture. And they're all woven together to get us to consider the ecological or relational landscapes of the various entities which you've populated this world with. Um, both works ask us to inspect what we consider to be real about nature, about what sentience and personhood mean, uh, and but really what's the difference between how we treat the real and imagined. I don't know if you'd like to tell us a bit more about your thinking behind this work. Yeah, thank you. And Helen, you you can speak so much better about it than me. You you just know well how to convey my thoughts and words. So <laughs> I'll try to speak a little bit in my I, I could try to convey it with images and you do so well with the words. But yes, it was really at this point, um, this is 1999, this piece was created. So, you know, where we looked at the first work from 1982, a lot of years have passed and getting me to, to think again as an artist concerned about where we as humanity are going in the future, knowing that we, it is us who have invented these technologies that are, are now so crucial, not to mention right now with the COVID world we're entering, we're all in virtual worlds now, but, um, I, I wanted to make this piece, uh, it's been seen both as an early virtual reality piece and then in this way as a full screen immersive environment. But I was trying to think of where, you know, here we are inventing virtual reality and, and with my interest in the human body, I think part of my interest is knowing that with technologies, we're starting to leave the importance of the human body or we think we think we can leave it. And with, with the Bush soul, I thought about a world, I created this world in which there's artificial life forms that live in this artificial world and they have behaviors and personalities and desires and they go about living their world based on a set of rules that I set up. Um, so it's a kind of artificial intelligence and then I thought, what does it mean for us to enter these worlds? We don't 
our body isn't entering, our, in a way just our mind is entering. And um, I looked at some history about uh, belief in West Africa that there are multiple souls. I thought when we go in virtual reality, perhaps our soul goes in there, our body isn't going in there. So the way this is, is it's interactive. Your quote soul enters this virtual world and interacts and observes these artificial life forms. And so there was the question of where, where are our souls, what's happening when we more and more live in virtual spaces? Is, is that reality our reality? I've used a term early on, I had a research team called liminal devices. It, this idea that we're now living, we understand what it means to live in two places um, at once in the real world and the virtual world. And how is that affecting us as humans? How is our relationship with artificial life forms, robots, AI, all these things we hear are happening more and more. What does that mean about us as a human? Are we gonna become more like them? Are they gonna become more like us? How do we connect? Um, what's a world if it's not physical and our body isn't needed in the world? So there is a sense of, uh, you, you brought up some issues too about our essential selves. Because I feel like what technology, oh. our invention is doing, is making us more and more think about what is it to be human? Um, what I'm, I'm interested in how, uh, how we can be this transformed human. We're transforming very much now. And um, what does that affect uh, how, what is it if we don't have anything but ourselves to reflect on? Um, <laughs> this could go on forever, but maybe Helen, you can comment on that too. Um, so, Rebecca, one of the things I just love about your work is your complete disregard for geographical, temporal, and tribal context. And by tribal, I mean this idea of how people act when they're with their families, their friends, um, and their peer groups, and, and you know, how people match their behaviors to the values of the, a particular social set that they aspire to. Uh, many philosophers, such as Heidegger, hold that we are essentially an escape, inescapably social beings. But with you and the work that you do, there's always this sense that you're digging to, to uncover what lies beneath, um, what lies beneath our moral psychology, like the sense of ourselves that's created by our environment and what it is to be our true metaphysical selves because you allow us to move in a reality that's different from our own and um, we can be in these imagined worlds that you create without being judged so your worlds become a world where we can just be our authentic selves. Yes, and actually, Peter, maybe we could talk a minute, but you could play this. I think the, the sound will be lower. It, it, it may come over a little bit. Um, let's see how it's OK, done. but we'll see. Oh, um, sorry, sorry, beg your pardon. That's the problem with going off the, the window. Oh, yes, right. <laughs> I've done it again. I do it <laughs> Okay. Technology, we love it. <laughs> okay, um, so so yes, there there's a lot of layers <laughs> in my work. That's why I love Helen to help me unwrap some of the layers. Um, and the bush soul, for instance, it came out of my bizarre experience in video game working in a video game company at Virgin. Um, but understanding that these interactive environments can be so much more than what video games were. And so 
in creating this world full of artificial life, one idea was that you can't, you don't go there to destroy it, to build it, to rearrange it. You, your soul, which is that white sparkling sphere, is is only there to interact um, and and understand this world of artificial life. I think this is important now. I, a lot of these ideas, like this was ninety nine. I think people are beginning to understand this, especially maybe in this world we live in now with COVID-19 and that we're being forced to be in, in virtual worlds for, for even our social connections, which is very unusual. Um, so here we are, and this is what I've been thinking about as an artist. I'm help, I want to help humanity move into this space that technology for better or for worse and often for worse is taking us into, but um, to use it as a way to really get down to what is key to, what is key to making us human? And are we changing our humanity in a good way, in a bad way? What does it mean? What does it mean when we're living more with artificial life, with artificial intelligence, with robots, with forms creatures that are sort of human but not quite human and who are we what you know wh what are our beliefs what are our kind of spiritual beliefs there's a lot of as I use in pieces a lot of metaphors like right now you're going into what I call this energy pit in the bush soul there's a lot of uh, attention to to special places. Uh, there's beliefs about sacred mountains and you can feel energy from it. So in the bush soul, the way I bring the body in is holding the joystick. When you're, for instance, right in this video, you're starting to feel intense reactions from your joystick, which shows you just through your sense of touch that you're in a special place. Um, uh, with a special energy. So that happens, that's another layer in the bush soul that happens throughout. And then knowing, oh, I could talk that. for a long time, but uh, uh, perhaps we should go to the other piece to, that ties in some of those ideas. Our time is, as we're recording this on the uh, amazing platform Zoom, um, our time is slowly um, ebbing away. So what I want to do is just see if I can quickly just give the the viewers at home, a, a view of the amazing shadow screen that we, we had the, the uh, Life Without Matter installation. And we're just going here. So it really was a curved screen wall. That's the uh, scanning camera you can see there. And I'll just bring up this this box to show Life Without Matter. And Helen, have you got a question now for, uh, for Rebecca? Yes. Yes. I mean, again, with Life Without Matter, Rebecca, you pull from ancient Greeks with um, the idea of Plato's cave, these mythical chimerical human animal figures and um, the cosmologies of the indigenous people of North America. Um, and, and, and this particular piece really is a, 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 a way to get us to think about um, to help us have a more fluid understanding of of gender and transformation, and um, what again always what it means to be human and and human in a true self, and um, that's something I was hoping you might talk about a little bit. Yes, thank you. Um, this this in a way it is you know, very connected uh, as to the bush soul and the thinkings that have continued in my work and beginning in 2016 with the new technologies of VR, I'm using the, the uh, HTC Vive VR set. And the reason I use Vive is in virtual reality, I wanted to create, again, to create a piece that was interactive that actually involved the physical body of the person interacting, and and by holding controllers, you can you can um, affect the world, the virtual world. But at this point, in 
this this was the commission piece from Quad in 2018 for this show, and the the title "Life Without Matter" is is really getting to something. Again, I think people can understand more in the life we're living right now. It's like, are we getting rid of if we're all living in virtual reality? What is the physical now? What is our physical body? What are physical objects, things made of matter, actual physical materials? And and I was playing with this title also with the idea, life without matter, the other definition of matter, of what's going to matter to us in this new world we're moving into. And does anything matter? And we'll be, we'll be free without concerns or matter. So there's layers and as you mentioned too i i really i mix <laughs> i mix um mythic images and places i'm not connected to any geographical place because again i i look for what is common to all humans is there a common language regardless of culture and geography that we can all connect to as humans i'm i'm on a new piece i'm working on now with with uh, machine learning, I'm I'm teaching the machine to learn how to move like a human, <laughs> computer generated <laughs> characters. And I'm looking. I've got some old books of mine by Edward Hall. He was a anthropologist where he looked at subtle movements of the human body and how we communicate. And my thought of how we're 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 losing those. We're losing those with Zoom meetings, but. But with life without matter, again, a mythical space that we start in, um, the Plato's cave that you referred to was my other thought about showing virtual reality in a, in a uh, gallery, which is meant to be a public place. And the fact that in VR, it's funny, you walk in a gallery and all you see are people <clears throat> with these headsets on and they're in their own world and um, not interacting. A lot of people say, oh, what's wrong with virtual reality is you've got to be, you've got to share it. You can't be in there with people. And I say today with our oversharing, we share everything. That's what we're supposed to do. I think we're starting to lose our ability to reflect on ourselves, to be alone with ourselves. So I was playing with the idea that, yes, I like that VR in the way I'm treating it isn't a shared world. It really forces you to be with yourself, but also because you're in a public space, um, we set it up so the, the person using the VR is inside a room in their own space, but those outside, they can't see what that person is experiencing, that world. They can only see the shadow of that person. And that's exactly the story of Plato's cave. And it questions, you know, our reality. Like, are we trapped in sort of a shadow or limited dimension now? And we'll be able to see more dimensions? Um, or, you know, what will VR, what will other these augmented realities have to do with our physical reality? Shall we, as we, just before I have to wrap up, sadly, and I could listen and listen to Helen's questions all day long. Thank you, Rebecca. We'll play just the beginning of this, this VR work that people could experience in the space. I should also say it went to the Zablodovich collection as well, and we should exhibit it in London too. Yes, and when you see, that's your hand. That's your hand that is coming in. You see your virtual hand and you've activated this event that brings up a mirror. Here we're in uh, this interior space. It, it, it actually, one of my inspirations was so, uh, Silbury Hill in the UK. There's these mythic places all around the world. These, in this case, these mysterious mounds. And I'm looking like we're inside something like this. But what's happening here is as the viewer is looking, they see themselves reflected in this mirror um, as both sometimes they control it, sometimes the character controls them. Um, but 
but now it will work again as a mirror. First, the form you see as a female, then the form you see as a male. And the movement is caused by the, play, the player, the viewer, the participant. So uh, it's interesting, do we move differently when we see our reflected image as a female versus a male? There's questions about if we're life without matter, does it matter what gender we are? You know, can we, does gender make sense anymore if we can see ourselves as male, female, or even animal? So there's some of these questions that happen with this piece. And as I do with a number of my pieces, I also pull in nature. In this case, it's, it's artificial nature. It's a digital representation of nature. But all of these issues are questions about what's life in the future? What are we doing? We have to think more about creating our virtual worlds and our virtual artificial life forms, our AI. And, uh, I, unfortunately, thanks to Zoom and the 40 minute limit, um, our time is almost <laughs> up. I, I could listen for hours to both of you talk. I can't thank you both enough for doing this tour with me. I'd just like to say a very final thanks to our Funders Arts Council England and Derby City Council, uh, to V21 for this um, art space for this amazing scan, and Rebecca Allen in Los Angeles, Helen Starr in London, and myself, Peter Bonnell in Derby. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe and well if you're listening to this during the pandemic, and if you're not, I hope you enjoy it later on. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you, both of you. Beautiful people. <laughs>